Good day, everyone. So for this topic, I am to discuss the measurements of lipids in the laboratory. So what are lipids? So lipids, we commonly refer them as fats. And their characteristic is that they are insoluble in water. So just imagine the oil that cannot be mixed with water. So the, those are lipids. So they are insoluble in water. However, they are soluble in organic solvents. So what are these organic solvents? So we have examples like chloroform, ether, hexane, and then we also have benzene. And also I have mentioned in the carbohydrate discussion that when glucose cannot be used as an energy source, we can resort to using lipids instead. So these lipids are energy rich hydrophobic molecules. Hydrophobic because they are insoluble in water. So they're water-fearing molecules. And also, as I have mentioned, we have different lipids in the body. So in the plasma, we have four main lipids. So number one, we have cholesterol. Next, we also have the triglycerides. Then, we also have the phospholipids. And then lastly, we have the non-esterified fatty acids. And take note, these lipids are insoluble in water. So our blood is made up mainly of water. So how can these lipids be carried to our bloodstream? Because they are insoluble in water. So that means they are also insoluble in our blood. So these lipids are transported by lipoproteins in our blood. So lipoproteins are proteins that carry lipids, not the other way around. So do not, do not be confused with that one. And also for the lipid profile, we call it as cardiac or heart profile because this lipid profile is usually tested um, in the laboratory to screen for primary and secondary hyperlipidemia and also the monitoring of the treatment of this hyperlipidemia. And another thing also, it is tested to monitor the risk for atherosclerosis. So that's why it's cardiac or heart profile. And we have here four tests included for lipid profile. So we have the total cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, and LDL. So again, these lipids are transported in the body by lipoproteins. And um, these triglycerides um, are stored lipids in the body. So this one. So these are the stored lipids in the body. And then also we have the HDL and LDL. So the HDL, it's the good cholesterol. It's actually a lipoprotein which is called as the good cholesterol. Whereas the LDL is the bad cholesterol. So to easily remember that one, just remember that HDL. Okay, it begins with letter H. So H, heaven. So that's good cholesterol. L, lethal. So that's bad cholesterol. And another thing is that the HDL migrates in the alpha region of electrophoresis, whereas the LDL migrates in the beta region. That's why you can commonly um, encounter some associations such as HDL, that's a good cholesterol, so hooray alpha. And then LDL, bad cholesterol, that's lethal, so bad beta. So that's to easily remember those lipids in the body. And next one for specimen consideration. So the fasting hours for lipid profile is 12 to 14 hours. How about for fasting blood sugar or the fasting plasma glucose? I hope you still remember this one. So the recommended fasting time is 8 to 10 hours. That's for FBS and for lipid profile, that's 12 to 14 hours. I am asking this one because commonly in the laboratory, the patient will be tested for multiple analytes. It's not only FBS or it's not only one analyte, but normally you could encounter a lot of patients who will be tested both for FBS and lipid profile. And both tests have fasting requirements. So that's why you need to be very careful in telling the patient on the proper procedure for fasting. So the fasting would mean that the patient should not eat anything. Even if it is a biscuit or candy or any food, there should be 
non per orem, or that's what we call as NPO. And then the patient um, sometimes would tell you if he can drink water. Yes, the patient could drink or could consume small amounts of water, but any fluids are not acceptable for fasting. So like coffee, milk, or any chocolate drinks or juices. So they are not allowed when the patient is fasting. And also, as stated in here, the chylomicrons and triglycerides, they are increased after meal. So they are increased postprandially. However, for the LDL and HDL, they decrease transiently or temporarily after eating. And also, there are patients who cannot fast for a longer period of time. That's why this one, the NCEP or the National Cholesterol Education Program recommends 9 hours of fasting for those patients who cannot do the 12 hours to 14 hours fasting because according to them, this 9 hours fast only produce um, minor and clinically insignificant errors. So that's why um, in the laboratory, um, sometimes when a patient is tested for lipid profile and for FBS, they would have a 10 hour fast. They would instruct the patient that um, the patient would fast for 10 hours because for the FBS, the 10 hours is acceptable, right? And for lipid profile, 10 hours is also acceptable because NCEP recommends only a minimum of 9 hours fast. And also, some of the laboratory would suggest the patient to fast for 12 hours. And that's also okay because 12 hours is okay for lipid profile, but how about for FBS? It's only up to 10 hours, right? But why is it that others' laboratory would recommend a 12 hours fast for both tests because for FBS although the recommended time of fasting is 8 to 10 hours the patient can fast up to a maximum of 14 hours that's why a 12 hours fast for FBS is still okay so I hope you remember that one and also the plasma so the plasma sample is preferred when lipoproteins will be measured by this method, so the ultracentrifuge and electrophoresis method or the lipoprotein electrophoresis. And we are talking about plasma, so the anticoagulant that is preferred is the ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, the purple top. And also serum can be preferred when it is necessary to store samples or this serum is also preferred if the cells are separated from the fluid component of the blood within 30 minutes. So you can use serum. And then another one. So the recumbent position of the patient, or should I say, when a patient is lying down, it would decrease his or her lipoprotein concentration by 10%. And you have to take note that postural changes greatly affect the lipoprotein concentration. That's why in the laboratory, the posture or the instruction to the patient um, about this posture should be standardized when um, the patient is being monitored by the lipoprotein concentration. And that the NCEP also recommends that the patient should have at least seated for five minutes prior to specimen collection. So you have to instruct the patient to sit down for five minutes before you take blood sample to him or to her. Because this recumbence or this position of lying down will cause the influx of water to the intravascular space and would dilute the non-diffusible plasma components in the blood of the patient. And aside from that, prolonged tourniquet application increases the lipoprotein concentration by 10 to 15%. So that prolonged tourniquet application would lead to hemoconcentration, increasing the lipoprotein concentration. So that means we have to instruct, um, I mean, as medical technologists, we really have to be careful not to leave the tourniquet on the arm of patient for more than one minute. And also, if you are looking for veins and you are having a hard time finding the vein of the patient, you have at least um, two minutes interval every examination of the arm of the, of the patient to prevent this hemoconcentration. And also, we have here the different analytical methods for total cholesterol and triglyceride measurement. So we have for the total cholesterol, 
we have chemical method and thematic method and let me emphasize this one the gcms method so that is the reference method so that gas chromatography mass spectrometry this is now the reference method because um formerly is the abel kendall that is the reference method but this one this gcms is the reference method because it specifically measures cholesterol and it does not detect related sterol so it's specific to cholesterol and also it was shown that this reference method the gcms has a good agreement with the result of the definitive method and what's that definitive method so we have the isotope dilution mass spectrometry and also we have here also the list for triglyceride measurement okay so now let's have the chemical method so this chemical method employ an acidic color developer mixture and we have two general color reactions so they are color coded for you to easily remember the end product of this chemical method so we have the Lieberman burchard so it produces a green end product the cholesterol dienyl monosulfonic acid when the cholesterol is reacted with acetic anhydride and concentrated sulfuric acid however for the salkowski reaction you could have red cholesterol dienyl disulfonic acid when the cholesterol is reacted to a mixture of perichloride and perichloride and perchloric acid so those are the two color reactions the chemical methods for cholesterol measurement and the next one we also have this term direct colorimetric method so direct colorimetric because there is a direct addition of color reagent mixture to the sample and we have several methods like the pearson we also have the stern and mac gavak we also have the Ribna and his or her colleague. And then for the two steps method, we have here extraction and colorimetry. So those are the two steps in the two step method. So first, the cholesterol is extracted using an alcohol ether mixture. That's in the Bloor's method. So Bloor's method is a two step method wherein again the cholesterol is extracted using an alcohol ether mixture. So that's the first step. Extraction of what? Of cholesterol using what? Alcohol ether mixture. And then for colorimetry, after extraction, okay, the specimen will be measured by colorimetric method, particularly the leiberman burchard reaction. So that's for the Bloor's method. So Bloor's. E L O O R apostrophe S. And the next one, we have the three step method. So it involves three steps. We have saponification, extraction, and colorimetry. So this one, specifically, the Abel Kendall, which is the former, former reference method, utilizes the three steps method. So you have here the details of Abel Kendall. So there is first um, saponification with potassium hydroxide so the cholesterol is hydrolyzed with an alcoholic potassium hydroxide since this is also a measurement of alcohol uh, of cholesterol right and then the unesterified cholesterol is extracted with petroleum ether and then just like the two-step method there will be a colorimetric method so measurement with still leiberman burchard reaction so that's for Abel Kendall, wherein the cholesterol esters are converted to free cholesterol by an alkaline saponifying agent. So this one, the alcoholic potassium hydroxide. And that the final end product um, um, we, uh, has a peak absorbance at 505 nanometer. So that's for the three-step method. And then another one four-step method so it has this saponification extraction it also has precipitation so that is precipitation and then you also have polyrimetry so still leiberman burchard reaction so we have here the parrot and jong schonheimer and sperry and then sperry and webb okay for the enzymatic method so 
this is more rapid and less subject to interference. So as what you can see, how many enzymes are involved in this reaction. So we have, we have three enzymes. So we have the cholesterol ester, esterase, I mean. So we have here cholesterol esterase, which converts the cholesterol ester into free cholesterol and fatty acid. So that means this cholesterol esterase would convert the esterified cholesterol to the free cholesterol. And then another one, another enzyme, the cholesterol oxidase converts this free cholesterol to this 4 cholestin free own and hydrogen peroxide. Okay, and this one, to be specific, this is what we call as the Trinder reaction, the one box in yellow. So that's Trinder reaction. Okay, and as what you can see here, there is a production of quinone imine dye and water. So that quinone imine dye is a red color. And it is also red at 500 nanometer. I think it's here. So the color reaction is measured at 500 nanometer, but for linear measurement, it is at 600 to 700 nanometer. And then the cholesterol oxidase here also reacts with other sterols. That's why you can see the GCMS is the reference method because it does not react with other sterols. So for the enzymatic method, we have here the advantages of over the colorimetric method so it's precise and also accurate it has lesser interference with bilirubin ascorbic acid and hemoglobin smaller quantity of specimen is required it's also rapid and it does not require preliminary extraction steps just like the two three and fourth step four step method and it can be used to measure anesterified cholesterol by omitting the deesterification step. And also mild reagents are used and this is best suited or better suited for automated analyzers. However, despite of its advantages, this has also its own disadvantages. So this is not absolutely specific for cholesterol. So that means the enzyme, the cholesterol oxidase, can react with other sterols particularly the plant sterol. So that's why this is not the reference method again. And also, aside from that, the um, ascorbic acid and bilirubin can interfere by consuming the hydrogen peroxide. So that means it could lower um, or falsely lower the cholesterol value. So particularly, the effect of that... Um, Ascorbic acid and bilirubin is significant at, at a concentration of greater than 5 mg per dl. So that would decrease the cholesterol value for about 5 to 15%. Okay, and then another one, triglyceride measurement. So this one, this triglyceride, so again, this is also tested in lipid profile. So this is responsible for serum turbidity if, if the concentration is greater than 400 mg per dl. And the turbidity in serum because of this um, triglyceride is what we call as lactescence. So that's lactescence, meaning turbidity of the serum. And that is because, again, of increased triglyceride value beyond 400 mg per dl. And we have to take note also that the peak of plasma triglyceride occurs 2 to 6 hours after eating. So that's the highest um, triglyceride value that you can get. That's why fasting is really needed when a patient is required to be tested for triglyceride. And also, we have two sources of triglyceride. So we have the chylomicrons and then the VLDL. So chylomicrons, that's the exogenous triglyceride. So I know you learned this from your lecture. So exogenous triglyceride because from your diet, it will be absorbed to your intestine and then it will be brought to your circulation or stored to your liver as chylomicron remnant. I hope you still remember this one. And that these chylomicrons, these exogenous triglycerides are cleared by 
LPL. What is this? Lipoprotein lipase. So I hope you remember this one in your um, lipid metabolism pathway. And also, the VLDL or the very low density lipoprotein is what we call as the endogenous triglyceride. So this one, this is cleared by HTGL. So what is this? This is hepatic triglyceride lipase. Take note again, endogenous. Remember, chylomicrons from the diet, it will be, um, from the diet, the lipids will be absorbed in your intestine, right? And it is the chylomicrons that will package that lipids in the diet from the small intestine towards the circulation or to the liver as chylomicron remnant. So the chylomicrons will be packaged together with that apolipoprotein. So what is that apolipoprotein? It's the apo B48. I hope you could still recall that one. And also for VLDL, because from the liver, the remaining um, lipids brought by the chylomicrons in that area will be delivered um, by the VLDL from the liver toward, towards your cells or towards the circulation. And again, this is cleared by hepatic triglyceride lipase. Next one, we also have the triglyceride measurement. So for triglyceride measurements, we have two general processes. So first, we have hydrolysis of triglyceride, either enzymatically using a lipase or with an alkali or that's the saponification method to form what? Glycerol and fatty acid. So the triglyceride and the water will be converted to glycerol and three fatty acids. And the next one, we have the measurement of glycerol. So the saponification, we saponify it with the use of alcoholic potassium hydroxide or chloroform and also the um, this is measured um, in absorbance at 340 nanometers so I mean the decrease in absorbance is measured at 300 nanometer next one for the chemical methods of triglyceride so we have the Zilver Smith and Van Handel so this one extract triglyceride in serum by the addition of Bluer's reagent. So the Bluer's reagent contains alcohol and ether. So that's in 3 is to 1 ratio. And also there is, um, after extraction by Bluer's reagent, there is addition of potassium hydroxide. So this is alkaline hydrolysis step. So it's the Bluer's reagent here that will extract the lipids. So this is the summary of the chemical method. So the triglyceride again. Okay, after the addition of potassium um, hydroxide, after alkaline hydrolysis will be converted to fatty acids and glycerol. And after the addition of this one, what is this? This is a per iodate. So after the addition of per iodate, it will be converted to formaldehyde forming the chromotropic acid. And then you have here, um, you have here the pink chromophore as the end product. So that's for the chemical method of triglyceride. Now for the enzymatic methods, as what you can observe here, we have four different enzymes. So we have lipase, the glycerol kinase, the pyruvate kinase, and the lactate dehydrogenase. So this enzymatic method is universally used and there is no extraction process needed in lipase and enzymatic method. And also take note that different manufacturers of the assays employ different coupling reactions that could measure the glycerophosphate to quantitate this triglyceride value. And also, the endogenous glycerol in plasma, and take note of this one, there could be glycerol contamination from certain lubricants in the stoppers of our tube, and that may contribute to a falsely high triglyceride value. So in this case, we need to do the blanking procedures. So it could be necessary if we suspect that there is contamination of glycerol from these stoppers. So what we have to do is we have to perform the procedure without adding lipase and after quantitation, the result now is the blank value which is deducted from the test result. So that's the blanking procedure. And also take note of these terms. We have lipemia and lipidemia. 
So when we say lipemia, that specifically refers to an increased triglycerides in the blood. Lipemia, triglycerides are increased. Whereas when we say lipidemia, it's more a more general term. So that means increased lipids in the blood. Next one, we have lipoprotein measurement. So again, what are lipoproteins? They are, they are proteins that carry lipids because take note that the lipids or the fats are insoluble in water, thus also insoluble in the blood. So we need lipoproteins for them to be carried in our bloodstream. So we have different techniques, electrophoretic technique, or should I say lipoprotein electrophoresis. We also have the ultra centrifugation technique also the poly and ion precipitation so let's have first this lipoprotein electrophoresis so just like in the electrophoresis procedure that i have discussed before we could also observe lipoprotein electrophoretograms just like this one you could see electrophoretograms and that electrophoretograms uh, are also visualized using stains so we use lipid staining dyes such as um, oil red O. So we have oil red O. We also have fat red 7D. And also we have Sudan black D. So these are the stains that we use for lipid um, electrophoresis or lipoprotein electrophoresis. And these lipid stains react primarily with the ester bonds in triglycerides and cholesterol esters. However, that um, you have to take note that there are lipoproteins which are rich in free cholesterol. So free cholesterol, take note, and phospholipids. So example of that is the lipoprotein X. So take note, these lipid stains react primar uh, primarily in the ester bonds. However, these lipids that are having... Um, a lot of free cholesterol in their structure and also phospholipids, they would stain very poorly in these lipid stains. So they are grossly underestimated by electrophoretic techniques. So you also have to consider that one. And also, what are the uses of this lipoprotein electrophoresis? So this one particularly, this is used to identify rare familial disorders. I know that you have tackled already this one in your lecture, such as the type 1, type 3 and type 5 um, and other hyperlipidemia. And also, um, talking about electrophoresis, the agarose gel is the most common medium used for lipoprotein electrophoresis. So, agarose gel. So, that's the most common medium used for lipoprotein electrophoresis and it provides a clear background and it's very convenient to use. We already know the advantages of that one. We have discussed that already in the electrophoresis procedure. And also, aside from that, aside from agarose gel, we could also use stage or the polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Remember the principle based on size? So it gives more detailed separation. And aside from that, it could fractionate the LDL subclasses. So that's for page. And then another one, this lipoprotein electrophoresis is useful particularly in qualitative analysis. But it is not that useful if we would quantify lipoprotein because of its poor precision and sometimes large systemic bias. Okay, and also um, take note of the migration. What can you say about chylomicrons? Does it migrate? So it stays at the origin, so it does not migrate. So chylomicrons stay at the origin. Another one, how about the LDL, low-density lipoprotein? As what I have mentioned, it's called as bad beta because it's a beta cholesterol or a beta lipoprotein because it migrates in the beta region of electrophoresis. How about for HDL? It's the alpha lipoprotein because it migrates in the alpha region. Whereas for this one, VLDL, it's 3-beta, before, before the beta. 
the VLDL. So it migrates in the data region. So those are for different migration patterns of the different um, lipoproteins. So we have chylomicrons. We also have low-density lipoprotein. We have very low-density lipoprotein. And we have high-density lipoprotein. Next one, we have the analytical centrifugation. So this is the reference method for lipoprotein measurement. Do not be confused because earlier I have mentioned reference method, but that one is for the cholesterol measurement. So that is the GCMS method. So for analytical centrifugation, this is also a reference method, but for lipoprotein um, measurement. And um, we have what we call as preparative preparative ULSA centrifugation because it uses sequential density adjustments of serum to fractionate major and minor classes of lipoproteins just like this one. So in analytical centrifugation, the lipoproteins are classified according to rate of flotation and that the rate at which the lipoprotein floats through a solution of sodium chloride with a specific gravity of 1.063 may be expressed in Wedberg units of flotation. So this is just Wedberg units of flotation. And also, we have here the comparison of the lipoprotein electrophoresis and ultra centrifugation method. So you have here again the alpha, the pre-beta, you have the beta, and you also have here the broad beta and the chylomicron that stays at the origin. So I hope you could correlate this one in your lecture discussion. And also, the lightest lipoprotein, that's why it floats on top, because it's rich in fat. So that's your chylomicron. And among the five of them, the heaviest in terms of density, because it has um, mostly um, protein content, so that's your HDL. That's why it's high density lipoprotein so it sinks it does not float on top so that's for analytical centrifugation next one the poly and ion precipitation so the lipoproteins precipitated with poly and ion such as heparin sulfate we also have dextran sulfate and phosphotungstate and then the reaction should be in the presence of divalent cations such as calcium magnesium, and manganese. So that's for poly and ion precipitation. How about now for HDLC or HDL cholesterol method using the poly and ion precipitation? So this one, the separation step is done manually and we have three general steps. So the step one, the beta lipoproteins and other lipoproteins are precipitated. Take note, the other lipoproteins are precipitated. And what do we use to precipitate them? So we use polyanion, divalent cations such as heparin sulfate, dextran sulfate, sodium phosphotungstate, and heparin. Well, um, with the addition, of course, of cations. So again, the beta lipoproteins and other lipoproteins will sink. So what happens to the HDL? It will be found in the supernate. And then, that will happen after centrifugation. So after addition of this um, divalent cations, the specimen will be centrifuged. So the, um, the high-density lipoproteins will be found on top, whereas the other lipoproteins are um, sedimented at the bottom of the tube. And the next one, a cholesterol assay is performed on the supernate, which gives the HDL concentration. So that is for the HDL method using the polyanion precipitation. So this is the illustration of the procedure. So just remember in your serum or plasma sample, it's not only that you can see one lipid, but you can see a lot of lipids or fats in your sample. So what happens is we add that divalent cation, such as this one, and that divalent cations will precipitate the beta lipoproteins and other lipoproteins such as chylomicrons and VLDL. 
So where can we find now the HDL? In the supernate. And then again, after we get this supernate, a cholesterol assay is performed using a liberman burchard reaction which gives the HDL concentration. So we can find, find this one in the residue or in the sediments, bacillomicrons, LDL, and VLDL because we are only after um, with the HDL. Okay, we also have homogeneous assays, the automated ones for the HDL cholesterol. So reagents are added to form a stable complex with non-HDL um, lipoproteins, preventing them from participating in the reaction. So take note, the non-HDL lipoproteins are prevented from the reaction so that we can only measure the HDL by adding another reagent that would measure the cholesterol concentration and would speak of the concentration of the HDL. So that is for the homogeneous assay. How about for LDL measurement? So for LDL measurement, we have this indirect method. So we call it as Friedwald, Fredrickson, and Levy formula that was established in 1972. So in the laboratory, usually LDL is manually obtained from the value of total cholesterol, HDL, and VLDL. So you have here the formula. So the total cholesterol is equal to HDL plus LDL plus VLDL. So they, these are the total cholesterol. So to get the um, LDL, we just need to subtract this HDL and VLDL from the total cholesterol value. And also, applying the Friedwald formula, so the indirect method again, we could divide the triglyceride value by 5 to get the um, concentration of VLDL. So VLDL is equal to triglyceride divided by 5 if the triglyceride is less than or less than 400 milligrams DL because sometimes the machine would not measure triglyceride levels beyond 400 milligrams per DL. And also, we could use um, triglyceride divided by 2.175 if it is expressed in SI unit to get the VLDL. So again, the machine would read the total cholesterol, the HDL, and the VLDL value. But if you want to compute it manually, then you could have this formula, the Friedwald formula. And other books, um, you also have this um, formula. The VLDL is equal to triglyceride multiplied by, uh, multiplied by 0.16. So that's also in milligrams per DL. And that to get the VLDL value. So again, that's the Friedwald formula. So um, the formula cannot be used if the triglyceride concentration is greater than 400 milligrams per dl or in SI it's 10.39 millimoles per liter. So that I think you could already observe lactescence okay, in this um, serum sample. And also this formula is erroneous when the triglyceride is again greater than 400 milligrams per dl and if the patient has type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia. So the first one here, it would be erroneous because there will be an underestimation of low-density lipoprotein. So the LDL will be decreased. Whereas for letter B here, there will be an overestimation of LDL. So in these cases, the direct measurement of LDL is required, again, for both of these cases. Remember this one, this is an indirect method. For the direct method, we have the DeLong. So we call it DeLong. So to get the VLDL value, so VLDL is equal to, so what's the formula? So triglyceride divided by 2.825. Okay, so that's for the DeLong value. Or you could use triglyceride divided by 6.5, okay? And then for the direct method, the combination of two reagents are used. So first reagent 
It removes the non-LDL proteins, whereas the second reagent releases cholesterol from LDL, so it can be measured enzymatically. So that's for the LDL measurement. So we have here the adult reference ranges for lipids. So again, all of these are the analytes tested for lipid profile. So take note earlier as what I have said, triglyceride and LDL should have a fasting requirement of 12 hours. However, for total cholesterol and HDL, fasting is not recommended. And we have here the reference value in conventional unit. And to convert it to SI, you have um, to multiply the cholesterol, so this one, the three of them, to 0 0.026. Or the long numbers, we have the 0 0.02586. For triglyceride, it's 0 0.01129. So that's to convert the conventional value to the SI value. So that would be all for my discussion. I hope you learned something. Thank you so much and God bless.